Hello everyone, my name is John Kraft, and this video is the next one in our short series where we build our own low-cost digital phase array beamformer. And then we see what we can do with that beamformer. This video is gonna be all about the very cool topic of monopulse tracking. It'll be a lot of fun, and you'll actually see it working at the end. And I'll walk you through all the steps so that if you want to build it at home, you definitely can. So in this video, we'll first understand the need for a tracking algorithm. Then we'll go through the concepts and math for a monopulse tracker. And finally, we'll build an adaptive routine that will always keep our beam perfectly focused on the signal of interest. Then we'll demonstrate all of this with our two-channel digital Pluto beamformer. So we'll scan the room, we'll find an RF source, and then lock into that source as it moves around. To do this, we'll be building off the concepts and construction of that Pluto beamformer. We built that in last week's video. So if you haven't seen that video yet, I'd recommend checking it out just to see how we got to this point. And we ended that video by plotting our antenna pattern and then finding the peak of that. Um, and that peak corresponded to the direction of arrival for the RF signal. So if we know the direction of arrival of our RF signal, then why isn't that good enough? Why do we need an adaptive tracking algorithm? So let's think about that now. Imagine that we use our Pluto digital beamformer to receive an internet data stream from a satellite. So we do a scan and we find the RF signal from that satellite. And this is basically what we did in the last video. We then calculate the direction of arrival of the satellite signal and program that phase delay into Pluto. But let's say that it's a low Earth orbit satellite, and so it moves around pretty fast. And when it moves, our program phase shift will end up pointing our beam in the wrong direction. So we need to scan again to refine the satellite signal. But while you're scanning, we can't be communicating with the satellite because our beam is gonna be pointed in, in different directions. But eventually we find the direction of arrival again, and then we program that back into our beamformer. But then the satellite moves again, and we once again are not pointing our beam at it. So we lose the internet connection. And then we have to rescan again to find where the satellite signal is coming from. But here's the beauty of monopulse tracking. With the same information that we grab from the satellite to receive our internet signal, with that same information, we will also calculate the optimal angle to steer our beam. So our beam will always be pointed at the signal of interest and there will be no interruption of the data stream. We never have to rescan to find the satellite. This is an extremely clever technique first demonstrated in the 1940s. So let's walk through exactly how it works or at least one way that it works. I, I think there's, there's probably multiple variations on this kind of a technique. So this is what our beam looks like now. And let's call it the sum beam, because as we saw in the last video, it is the summation of RX1 and a phase shifted RX2. And if you remember from the last video, this is what the sum beam looks like. Um, this is actually a plot of the array factor of the antenna, but for us, and especially for small steering angles, this will be very, very close to what the actual antenna pattern looks like. So I may just call it the antenna pattern. Um, and you can see that this blue sum beam here, and at the peak of that is the red dotted line. And this is the direction of arrival of the RF signal. And at that peak, the signal strength from RX1 is equal to RX2. Uh, as we go away from that peak, the two signal strengths are going to be different. So if we subtract RX1 from RX2, then at the peak, that subtraction will give some value very near to zero. And zero on the decibel scale is negative infinity. So it gives us this really sharp null exactly at the direction of arrival point. And you can see that curve in orange. Let's call that curve delta because it is the amplitude difference of RX1 and RX2. It gives us a much more accurate way to find the direction of arrival. It's a very sharp point instead of the dull rounded top of the sum beam. So now we have two curves, one for the summation of RX1 and RX2, and that's called sum, and another curve for the subtraction of RX1 and RX2, and that's called delta. So let's say that our beam was pointed a little bit off center. For example, we programmed our beam with a phase shift of minus 100 degrees instead of minus 68 degrees. So we're at the green line. If we looked at the difference between the blue sum point and the orange delta point, we could see that the difference is not very large. And so we would know that the RF signal is not centered in the beam. Because if it was centered, our difference would be very large. So we know we are not optimally pointed at the RF signal. However, we don't know which way to move the delay in order to recenter the beam on that RF signal. And this is because that same difference between sum and delta might actually mean we're on the other side of the peak, like this. 
So do we increase the phase shift on RX2 or do we decrease it? We don't have enough information to know this, but, and here's the key to monopulse tracking. If we were to also look at the phase difference between the sum curve and the delta curve, we would get this curve in green. And that phase difference goes from plus pi radians to minus pi radians. But look where our red dotted direction of arrival line is. It's exactly at the point where the phase difference switches from negative to positive. So that's the key. We now have all the information we need. The difference between sum and delta will tell us if we are off target, and the phase difference will tell us which way to move the beam. If the phase difference is negative, then we need to increase the phase shift on RX2. And if the phase difference is positive, then we need to decrease the phase shift on RX2. And actually, we don't need to know what the exact phase difference angle is. We just need its polarity. So this is what our plots will look like um, that we're going to do today. Phase polarity is plotted at the top, and then the sum and delta curves are going to be plotted below that. And all of this is obtained with just one buffer of data from our little Pluto. So let's dig into the Python script now and figure out exactly how we're going to do this. And then after that, we'll build an adaptive algorithm that finds an R of source and locks onto it as it moves around. OK, and here's the first Python file that we're going to take a look at. This file, again, is going to be stored on my GitHub page, github.com slash johncraft. And we have more beautiful boilerplates. I'm going to skip all of this here. This is all the same as it was at the last video. So we'll skip all of this. Nothing has really changed for that. And actually, let's get let's skip some of the new definitions. There's, there's two new functions, monopulse angle and scan for DOA that I've added. But let's skip those for now and instead just go right into the main work function down here. So this is a for loop. We're going to run a number of scans through it. And you can see that the, really the only thing that we do is we call this scan for DOA function. And then whatever that returns, we plot all of that data. OK. So now with that, let's go look at the scan for DOA function. Scan for DOA is very similar to what we were doing uh, last time where we were, we were plotting the antenna pattern and grabbing the peak response. We're still going to grab data from Pluto. We're going to divide that up into um, receive 0 and receive 1. Uh, we're going to go through all, all the different phase states from minus 180 to 180. And we're going to apply those phase delays to receive one. So we'll get a delayed receive one, and we'll add those up together to get a delayed sum. So far, that's all the exact same as we did uh, in the first video. But the new thing we're going to do is we're going to do delayed delta. So instead of adding them together, we're going to subtract them together. That's the only difference. And we take that delayed sum, and uh, we get the DBFS for it, as well as, as, well as the raw um, FFT value. And the same thing with uh, the delayed delta. Now we need to calculate the phase difference. That was that green curve that we looked at uh, just a minute ago. And so to do that, I've added a new function here called monopulse angle. And that's going to take the raw FFT data from the sum and the delta curves. Let's take a look at that now. So here's the monopulse angle function. It takes two arrays of data, and it's going to return to us the phase difference between those two arrays. Now, there's several different ways that we could do this. If any of you saw um, the, the GNU radio presentation that I did a couple of years ago, I did it all in the time domain. And in that presentation, I looked at two time domain streams of data. I looked at where um, they were the maximum. And at that point, I looked at the sum and the delta points and took the phase difference between those two points. And that, and that actually works pretty well. Uh, but this time, uh, Dr. Travis Collins put me on to what might be a, a slightly better way to do it or more maybe mathematically kind of correct way to do it, and that's using the correlate function. I am not an expert on correlate operation. Uh, there's many places you can find out more information on, on the internet or books. It's a, it's a basic digital signal processing function. It's essentially a, a multiply accumulate operation where we're going to slide two arrays across each other. We're going to multiply different points together. We're going to add it all up together. And, and for each data point in the array, we get, we get a, a number that corresponds to how matched are these two arrays. We're going to do a simpler correlation operation. In NumPy, it's called the valid case. And this is for when two arrays are of the same length. We, we just do um, an operation. We do one correlate operation where 
uh, we overlap those two arrays and it, it gives us just one data point instead of a whole bunch of data points that you would normally get in a, in a correlation operation. And so we can do this correlate function on either time data or frequency data. And I've done it both ways. In fact, I left my old code in there for the, for the time domain data. And in both cases, we take the delayed sum data and the delayed delta data, and uh, we do the correlate operation on them, uh, and, and it works fine in both cases. I like the frequency case, which is the one that's in here now, because uh, it allows me to focus just on our signal of interest, that 200 kilohertz signal. So that's the one I've left in there, but feel free to play around with different ways to do it. And if you find some other neat way that has, that has some benefits or something, uh, or some other use cases, please, please leave a note in the comment. I, I'd love to hear of different, different ways to do this or different pros and cons of, of, of how to do this, this correlation function. But anyway, when, when we do this correlation, uh, we're gonna get back a complex number. Then we, we take the, the angle of that complex number and that, that angle is going to be the phase difference between these two arrays. And that's, that's, that's exactly what we want. That's what we were plotting on that green curve from the slides that we just saw. So we take that phase difference and uh, we append it into an array as well as the peak from the sum and the delta curves. They also get appended into an array. And then we also find the peak of that sum curve. This is exactly what we did before to calculate where our peak angle is. I left this all exactly the same. We have now some new ways to calculate that peak, right? We could look at the delta function where that's at a minimum. We could look at where that phase shift occurs, but I kept it the same as we did last time so that you could see that these are, these, these are, all, these are all lining up. They're all different ways to look at where that direction of arrival is. And, uh, and uh, you'll see that they all line up nicely. So that's it. That's, that's all we have to do in this function. And then um, the rest of this, after we call that function, is just, just plotting the data. This is the same as, as how we plotted it last time. Let's go ahead and run this now. Our phase scale is set to zero, so we'll have to modify that here in a minute. So it's telling us our peak signal occurs at 82 degrees, so we put in 82 degrees. Um, for the phase cal, because you can see from the camera that our uh, antenna is actually at zero degrees. So let's rerun this and see if it's now at zero degrees. Okay, perfect. So we've now calibrated our antenna array. Now let's go ahead and run more scans of this and I will move the transmit antenna back and forth and you can just note the response on these three curves. These, these three curves again, the green curve is the uh, polarity of the phase difference between sum and delta. The blue curve is the sum and the orange curve is the delta. Let's run this now. Over here around minus 20. So the most important thing to be looking at is that phase polarity, that green curve, because that's what we're gonna use when we make our adaptive tracking algorithm. And note that the phase polarity is always negative on the left-hand side and then uh, positive on the right-hand side of the direction of arrival. Okay, so that pretty much does it for this script. I hope that makes sense how we got uh, the sum curve, of course. We did that last time. The delta curve, that's very easy and then that phase polarity curve, that difference between the sum and the delta channel, the phase difference between the sum and the delta channels. I hope that that makes sense now. On our next script, we're gonna use those concepts to make an adaptive tracking algorithm. Okay, so in this Python script, we're gonna create an adaptive tracking algorithm. This file is located like the other ones on github.com slash johncraft. And most of this is gonna be the same as the previous one. A couple of things to note. One is that you need to pull in the phase cal that we used on the previous script into this one. Uh, that was 82 degrees. It should be the same, uh, you know, for the same setup. The other one to note is I switched from matplotlib to pyqt graph. Matplotlib is fantastic. It's it's you know it's very easy to use and it produces great quality images, but it's very very slow. And we're going to do this kind of a strip chart recorder or waterfall plot of angle versus time, and matplotlib just, is just too slow. PyQT graph is very, very fast. It's not quite as elegant as matplotlib, but it's very, very fast. And so I think you'll see how much, how much nicer this works here. 
But um, I point out PyQt graph. I think you also have to install PyQt5 in order to run this. So take a look at the documentation and then um, install PyQt graph library. So all of this is exactly the same as what we saw before. These functions are the same. We've added one new function in here, and that is the tracking function. But I'm going to delay talking about that function until we go through the main script. These commands here just set up the plotting for the PyQt graph. It look, might look a little bit different than matplotlib, but it's, it's the same kind of an idea. The first thing we're going to do here is we're going to do a scan for direction of arrival. And so we're going to do that same function that we used on the last script, and we're going to get this peak delay here. This is the phase shift that we need on Rx1 in order to point our beam. That is going to be our starting point for our monopulse tracker. We're never going to call scan for DOA again. We're never going to scan through all the different phase angles again. We just do it once. It's just for the initial condition of where do we start the monopulse tracker. The monopulse tracker runs in this update tracker block here. Update tracker is called by the, the uh, PyQt interface. It's just going to repeatedly call it over and over again. And basically what it's doing is it's running this tracking function to calculate a new delay based off of the last previous delay. So let's take a look at the tracking function now. So in the tracking function, we grab one buffer of data from Pluto, and we create our same delayed sum and delta curves. And we get the FFT from those curves. And then we calculate the phase difference between the sum and delta curves, just like what we did in the previous example. But the new piece of this is going to be, we're going to adjust what our delay is based upon the phase angle that we calculate. If the sign of the phase difference between sum and delta, if that is greater than zero, then we're going to decrease the amount of delay that we apply to Rx1. If it's the opposite, that is, if that angle between sum and delta is less than zero, then we're going to increase the amount of phase delay that we apply to Rx1. And then we're going to return that new delay. With that new delay, we're going to calculate a new steering angle. And then we'll plot all the steering angles versus time. So let's go ahead and run that now. So I'm going to move that transmit antenna there back and forth. And you should see that angle accurately reported on our little strip chart recorder here, this waterfall plot. Uh, no matter how fast I move it, it should stay locked in there. Again, we are not doing repeated scans to look for direction of arrival. This is a, a closed loop routine where we're updating the steering angle only based on the information out of that uh, received data packet. So it's a very cool technique. Hopefully you can see how fast it works. I hope that overview was helpful. This is just one way to do monopulse tracking. Um, If any of you have any comments or suggestions for improvement, uh, please let me know. And please, uh, I would love to see people uh, doing this if, if you're interested in this topic. But thank you all for watching. I hope this was helpful.